Hi, today we're going to be talking about the integumentary system. This is more commonly called the skin, although the integumentary system also includes some other parts, which are the hair, the nails, and some different glands. But the main part is the skin, and the skin is the largest organ of your body, and being an organ, that means it contains all four of those tissue types that we talked about, epithelial, connective, muscle, and nervous. Your skin makes up about 15% of your total weight and spread out, it's about 20 square feet in size, which is crazy. And right below your skin, there's this uh, connective tissue layer made of fat called the hypodermis that we'll talk about as well. But first, let's talk about some of the skin functions. The first main function is protection. It is a barrier between you and the outside world. So it's really good at resisting infection and preventing injuries. It's also waterproof and will prevent dehydration or desiccation. And there are special cells within your skin that help prevent too much exposure to UV radiation. So they block UV radiation with special pigments called melanin that we'll talk about. Also, some protection is from the nails on your toes and your fingers that allow us to be able to manipulate different things like tools. The second function of the skin is to help regulate body temperature or thermoregulation. So when you're hot and when you're cold, your body, specifically your skin, is able to react to that to help maintain homeostasis. So whether you're hot and your sweat glands become active and your blood flow increases, to release that excess heat or whether you're cold and your blood vessels are constricting and preventing heat loss and you're shivering to promote a little bit of heat retention. Those are ways that your skin could help regulate body temperature. The third function is to make vitamin D. So vitamin D is one of the few vitamins that your body can make by itself, but it can't without exposure to UV radiation or UV light. And it does so in a complex biochemical reaction that converts different molecules eventually into vitamin D, one of those molecules being cholesterol, which is why cholesterol is important. And vitamin D, once it's produced, is vital for calcium and phosphorus absorption. And that is particularly important with your skeletal system and your bones. Your skin also is able to excrete wastes. It's not a lot, but some are excreted through sweat, and so that is one of its mild functions. Um, as you sweat, you eliminate not only mainly water, but there are some metabolic wastes, nitrogenous wastes like urea, ammonia, uric acid, along with some salts. And finally, the last function of the skin is to collect sensory information. Your skin is riddled with nerves all over the place and different types of nerves or sensory neurons. And they're able to tell you what's going on, what, who's touching you, if, if it's pressure, if there's a fly on your skin, or if it's very painful. There are different sensory receptors. So looking at the skin, we're gonna label the anatomy of the skin, starting with the two main layers, the epidermis and the dermis. The epidermis is very thin, whereas the dermis is the thicker layer of the skin. And then all the other parts are just in one of those two layers. Now there is a layer, it's not skin, but there is a layer below the skin called the hypodermis. It is not a layer of skin. We call it the hypodermis or the subcutaneous layer because it, because it is below the skin or below the dermis. And that layer is made of mainly a fatty connective tissue called adipose. Other things that we have going on are nerves. I mentioned that there's a variety of nerves and you have somewhere around 77 feet of nerves in just one square inch of skin. And there's different types for different sensations. We have blood vessels and the blood vessels I think it's about 20 feet of blood vessels in a square inch. So these are actually delivering blood and nutrients to the dermis. And then those nutrients have to diffuse up into the epidermis where there's no blood vessels. The hair, there's a hair shaft sticking out of the epidermis and that is part of the appendages of the skin. So we have different parts of the skin that are found within it called appendages. Those include sweat glands that we'll talk about. There are little tiny muscles called erector pili muscles. There are oil glands called sebaceous glands. There are hair follicles and there are hair roots. Now to clarify something is that with the sebaceous or oil glands, they are kind of connected to this hair follicle. 
This picture does not label the hair follicle and the hair root very well. So this picture shows it because it has been cut. So this area right here, from there to there, is the hair follicle. It's like the house that you find the root inside of. And then this part right here that we see down here, this is actually the hair root from here to here. And that is not shown on this picture even though it's labeled on this picture. The sebaceous glands are connected to the follicle of the hair. The last couple things are pores. So sweat glands, they look like this little spaghetti string and they eventually form a tube and that tube opens up and it's called a pore, the opening. And sometimes sweat glands could actually open into the follicle as well, but we'll get to that. And the last thing is called dermal papillae. So if you separate the two layers, the epidermis and the dermis, there's these little projections called papillae, dermal papillae. And the purpose of them is to actually adhere the two layers together so they're not slipping on each other and they're not moving around. If they do move around, it's usually because of too much friction. And what happens is they separate and fill with fluid and we call that a blister. But for the main purpose, they're there to hold the dermis to the epidermis. Also, as the papillae protrude into the epidermis, it creates these things called epidermal ridges, which are commonly known as your fingerprints. So let's look at the epidermis and the dermis. This is a picture under a microscope. The first layer is called the epidermis, the outermost layer or the most superficial layer, and it's made out of epithelial tissue. The top layer, there's many, there's actually up to, there's four to five layers of epidermal cells, but the top layers are always the dead and always being shed constantly. You actually shed about a pound and a half of skin cells every year, which is kind of disgusting, but necessary. While the lowest cells of the epidermis are actually actively living and quickly dividing by mitosis to replace the ones that are constantly being shed. There's other, there's many cells within the epidermis, but there's only two that I want you to know for right now called keratinocytes and melanocytes. So keratinocytes produces protein substance called keratin, which you've probably heard before. And this is a tough, fibrous, waterproof protein. And it makes up your, not only your skin, but also your hair and your nails. And then there are melanocytes found in the epidermis. And the melanocytes produce a special protein called melanin. And melanin is a pigment. And there's a few different types of melanin, but it causes your skin to be the color that it is. When we look at this picture, you could see that there are different layers of epidermis that we're not going to learn in this class, but that the top layer is flat and dead, and you could see them starting to shed, whereas the lower layers of the epidermis are live cells, and they're actively dividing, and they push up the old ones to make room for the new ones, and as these cells start to push up, they slowly die. So looking at a more detailed picture of it, again, here's the different layers of the epidermis and then the dermis below, but this is showing a melanocyte and the melanocytes produce melanin or the pigment of your skin. Surprisingly, no matter what your skin color is, everybody has about the same number of melanocytes, but the difference is how much melanin they produce and the type of melanin they, they produce. And that's what causes the, the vast variety of skin pigmentation. The, um, other cell is called the keratinocytes, and you can see that they're labeled up over here, and they produce keratin. And so as these cells slowly migrate and get pushed up and away, they slowly fill with keratin, and keratin destroys all the organelles, like the nucleus inside, and they just become a big bag of keratin protein, and, it's, and it causes them to slowly die and flatten and gets pushed up into these other layers and then eventually shed. There are a few other important cells that are part of the epidermis, like Langerhans and Merkel cells, but we're not going to discuss them in this course. The layer below the epidermis is called the dermis. This is a thicker, deeper layer below the epidermis. There are two major connective tissue proteins that I want you to know that make up the majority of it. One of them is called elastin and one of them is called collagen. Elastin, just like the name says, is very stretchy and provides movement, yet it is very resistant and provides a lot of tension. And then the other one is called collagen, which is very flexible and strong and it prevents your skin from literally tearing in half all the time. Collagen is the most abundant protein 
in all animals. Now, the dermis also contains a bunch of other stuff. It's kind of where the party's at. So it has the hair follicles, the sweat and oil glands, smooth muscle, nerves, blood vessels. It's thicker, so it can contain all these other important structures. The dermis, because it contains nerves and blood vessels, specifically blood vessels, when you contain blood vessels or an area contains blood vessels, it's called vascularized. So blood is being delivered, nutrients are being delivered to all the dermal cells, but there are no blood vessels that go up into the epidermis. What happens is that in order for these cells to get the nutrients, diffusion occurs. So diffusion occurs from the dermis to the epidermis to feed the cells. Also, because the epidermis is avascular, let's say that you get a paper cut and it doesn't bleed, but it leaves that little mark, you probably just damage the epidermis. But if you slice your finger on a piece of paper and it starts to bleed, that's probably because you're down in the dermis. So you don't bleed unless you make it down past the epidermis into the dermis. The next is not part of the skin, it's a layer found below the skin called the hypodermis or subcutaneous layer. So this is just a connective tissue layer made of fat or adipose, and its purpose is to anchor your skin to what's below, which is mainly your different organs or your muscles or even your bones. It, because it's fat, and fat is good at storing energy, that's its, one of its functions, as well as insulation, cushioning, and flexibility. If you get a hypodermic needle, that shot goes into the hypodermis. Uh, this is a old school caliper and it actually measures the thickness of the hypodermis as a quick way to measure body fat. There are different skin appendages. These appendages include your nails, your hair, and some glands. So let's talk about the nails first. Nails are also made of keratin and they're produced in a similar way that skin grows. So what happens is that if we, well, let's take a look at the nail first. We have the body of the nail, right? And then we have the edge of the nail. There's some lateral skin folds in the cuticle. But I really wanna focus on the root of the nail and this area called the nail matrix. The matrix is the area with the most rapid cell division. So this is the most active part that's producing new cells. And those new cells are gonna to start to get pushed out this way. And as they get pushed out, just like your skin cells, they start to fill up with keratin and slowly die. And as they slowly die, they harden into what is known as your nail. And your nail slides and lies on top of the, um, the nail bed, which is epithelial tissue right below. It's interesting to know that your nails grow about three millimeters a month and that your fingernails grow faster than your toenails. The next skin appendage is hair. And hair grows just like nails and just like skin. So a couple things is that what we see above the epidermis is usually referred to as a shaft, and what's below is usually ref referred to as the root. And it kind of bulbs out, so we have this hair bulb that's surrounded by a housing called the follicle. Now down by the bulb, there's a special area called the matrix, and that's where active cell division is occurring. And those cells, just like before, are getting pushed up and slowly dying and filling with keratin, and they get slowly pushed up and out, and that is why your hair grows. They, um, the general idea is that they're, they help for insulation, although that's more prevalent in other mammals. And they could also sense touch. So there are def different sensory neurons that are attached to the follicle. And if the hair is moved, then you sense it. You know if somebody's touching your hair. Also, hair provides some UV protection from for your scalp. And in your nose or in your ears, it could help trap different debris. And it also reduces friction. And it's in interesting to know that your palms of your hands, the soles of your feet, nipples, parts of the genitalia, and your lips never have hair. So this is just a zoomed in picture. There are different layers to the hair that we're not discussing in this course, but you could see that you know that your hair has color and those color pigments are also made by melanocytes, just like in your skin. So these melanocytes produce melanin and then the melanin goes into the cells that are being produced and 
As those cells are slowly dying and filling with keratin, they maintain the pigment and you get your hair color. When these melanocytes become less active, your hair loses color and becomes gray or white. The next skin appendage are oil glands or sebaceous glands, and these are always usually associated with your hair follicle. In other words, they're attached to your hair follicle. And the reason for that is because they secrete an oil called sebum, and the sebum, as your hair grows, it kind of covers your hair, and it oozes out onto your skin and provides a nice, soft, and waterproof skin and hair. The sebum is also slightly acidic, so it's helpful at killing some bacteria. And guys make more of it than women because of testosterone, and so their skin tends to be a little bit tougher and greasier because of it. The other gland are called sweat glands or sudoriferous glands, and these help prevent overheating and help regulate temperature. Sweat is over 99% water, at least, but there are some salts in your sweat as well as some metabolic waste, such as nitrogenous waste, ammonia, urea, uric acid, lactic acid. And you can sweat out as little as maybe half a liter a day, all the way up to maybe on a very active hot day, up to five to seven liters, depending on what you're doing. Sweat is slightly acidic because of the uric acid and lactic acid that could be found within it. So it could also help inhibit bacterial growth. And there are two major different types of sweat glands that you're not responsible for knowing. One of them, called the eccrine gland, is the main type, and that just opens right up onto the surface of the skin, and that's your, quote, normal sweat. But there's apocrine glands that open into hair follicles, and their sweat contains a different composition that bacteria love. It has some proteins and lipids in it, so bacteria like that better. And so the bacteria within the apocrine sweat is what causes body odor. Also, mammary glands and a type of gland called the ceruminous glands are modified sweat glands. Mammary glands produce milk and ceruminous glands are found in your ears and produce earwax. And that's the basics about the integumentary system. I hope that was helpful.